In this news roundup of the week for 3rd of February 2023. Corruption continues to be the focus as more are raided in Ukraine and the EU and the UK have problems of their own. The UK's armed forces recruitment comes under scrutiny with allegations that competence is no longer a key criteria for Air Force pilots. The trans rapist prisoner row in Scotland has reached the point where Nicola Sturgeon's political end seems to be in sight. And in this week's short thought, we consider two articles that point to the ongoing demise of the mainstream media. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. The EU held a summit with Ukraine this week in Kiev, part of the extended process of Ukraine becoming a candidate for joining the EU. No doubt they wanted to discuss corruption. No, not the corruption scandal blazing across the EU right now. Not that one, obviously. Instead, they will have been focusing on President Zelensky's anti-corruption programme, which continued this week with raids on a number of high-profile figures, including Ihor Lolomoysky, one of the country's richest businessmen, with businesses in media, oil and banking. He wasn't named, but it was announced that large-scale embezzlement and tax evasion worth around a billion dollars had been uncovered on the part of the former management of Ukraine's two biggest oil companies. Reportedly, the former Interior Minister Arzen Avakov also had his house searched and the leaders of the Customs Service were fired. Meanwhile, the European Parliament voted to remove legal immunity from Andrew Cozzolino and Mark Tarabella, two MEPs caught up in the Qatar corruption scandal. Both have been accused of taking cash in exchange for influencing the Parliament's work in the favour of Qatar as well as of Morocco, claims that both of them deny. All of this was very timely, with Transparency International releasing its latest annual report on the state of corruption worldwide. As always, Scandinavia supplied the squeaky clean leaders with Denmark at the top, followed by Finland and Sweden. New Zealand was also up there at the top. In the EU, Hungary, Bulgaria and Romania were seen as the laggards with the most problems of corruption. In Europe, generally, the position remained that Russia came bottom, with Ukraine only slightly above it. Worldwide, Syria, South Sudan, Somalia were to be found at the very bottom. Interestingly, the UK, although within the better performing group, nevertheless hit a historic low in this index. The decline came from a number of incidents, such as the continuing emerging details of how certain companies were fast-tracked for contracts for PPE during the pandemic, with the key apparently being that connections with the government at the time were crucial. Also, investigations into how wealthy donors of the Conservative Party all seem to have an uncanny habit of being given a place in the House of Lords. One of the lessons being that even in well-regulated systems, when large amounts of money are committed and spent on an emergency time frame, there are always those waiting in the wings to seize on the opportunity. Something the EU might care to remember, as this week it announced it would be undertaking its own response to President Biden's so-called Inflation Reduction Act, more accurately described as his Climate Action Act. As I've reported here previously, Europeans have been deeply concerned that the American $369 billion support mandated by the Act, specifically for American green industry, will massively distort free competition and lead to an exodus of clean tech firms from Europe to America. Commission President Ursula von der Leyen announced this week that the EU would revise state aid rules to allow countries to provide their own targeted support for green industries, something that previously would not have been permitted. The Commission is also recommending redirecting funds towards a series of net zero benchmarks for 2030 via tax breaks for investments and a new sovereignty fund to be announced in the summer. As always, not everyone's thrilled at the move, coming as it does after a string of emergency subsidy rules due to the pandemic through to the war in Ukraine. The finance ministers of Finland, Czech Republic, Denmark, Estonia, Ireland, Austria, Slovakia all criticised what they described as permanent or excessive non-targeted subsidies proposed in response to the US. 
It's not the only needle match between the EU and the US this week. Politico reported that an insider in the German government said that the main reason Chancellor Olaf Scholz has been refusing to send certain arms to Ukraine unless the Americans did likewise is that he simply doesn't trust America to honour its NATO obligations if Germany were to be attacked in retaliation by Russia. Now that's quite a revelation because trusting the mutual commitment to defence is kind of the glue that holds NATO together. The NATO Treaty's Article 5 calls on alliance members to support one another in the event of an attack, but Schultz is worried that the US, with its more isolationist positioning maintained since Trump, not wholly ended after Trump, would choose not to get directly involved. Hence him insisting that American Abrams tanks had to go as well, so the US is fully in line with its EU allies. This is something of a stretch. I mean, before the tanks were agreed, the US was already many times deeper in than any other country with its military aid to Ukraine. Its $30 billion worth is more than 10 times the German contribution, for instance. And it does base 40,000 American troops in Germany, which you'd think was going to count as some kind of a commitment. But there you go. The German Chancellor plainly does not trust the United States. One of the principal senior members of NATO has come to mortally fear that the alliance's guarantees are not worth anything if the fighting actually kicks off. That is a rather important, not to say somewhat sobering, realisation. Olaf Scholz probably didn't find his mood much improved by his trip this week to South America, where he went to Brazil only to find newly installed President Lula da Silva implying at a joint press conference that maybe Ukraine was equally responsible for Russia invading. And he said this, I think the reason for the war between Russia and Ukraine also needs to be clearer. Is it because of NATO? Is it because of territorial claims? Is it because of entry into Europe? The world has little information about that. To be fair, the world has quite a lot of information on all that. You just have to take the time to look for it, maybe. Schultz may have come away reflecting that whether it's Biden following Trump or De Silva following Bolsonaro, the leaders who come in promising to be a big change in perspective seem to have a lot more continuity with their predecessors, at least from Germany's perspective, than he would be comfortable with. And this may be true. It's a reflection of the fact that when it comes to geopolitics, the pragmatic evaluation of what alliances, what positions, what commitments make sense to a specific nation can differ remarkably little, even with leaders who are unlike in every other way. A key question is, if it does all end up breaking down and we end up at war, will all the military diversity hires we've been making be up to actually fighting? In the UK, a Defence Select Committee was told that the Royal Air Force had actively discriminated against 160 applicants during a recruitment drive for women and people from minorities. Former Head of Recruitment Group Captain Elizabeth Nicoll resigned in protest at the discrimination. And she told the committee this, a precedence of selection was given to ethnic minority and female pilots over better qualified white pilots in order to improve the RAF diversity profile even though it could materially impact on the RAF's operational performance. Air Chief Marshal Sir Mike Wigston denied any discrimination. There was no compromise, he said, of entry standards or operational effectiveness, a claim that was somewhat undermined later when he was forced to admit that women in the RAF were unable to fly F-35 Lightning jets because the helmets provided were too heavy. A lighter helmet would not give the pilot the same degree of protection. And he added, there is an American helmet designed for females, which is lighter, but they cost a quarter of a million pounds each. What the heck is in those helmets? It used to be that one of the few places where diversity drives were not expected was the armed forces, where people have to be trained to fight and endure in the most difficult circumstances. With all respect to those women who are up to all challenges, because there are always some amazing individuals, this is surely one place where competence and ability should never be usurped as the sole criteria for selection. 
but apparently not. Unfortunately, and while not excusing it in the slightest, not entirely surprisingly, what the push has led to is a massive problem in the armed forces of failing to retain female personnel anyway because of the resulting massive culture of sexual harassment. Now, of course, we want armed forces where men are trained with the discipline not to be abusers. Women are not to blame for the actions of men, should not in any cases be driven out of a workplace by you excusing that sort of behaviour. But this is not surprising, and it displays incompetent management to target recruitment of less qualified diversity hires and then just to throw them into the forces without care and attention, wondering why they then don't end up having a good time. Still... At least those women maybe could make their way into politics. In the US, former US Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley is reportedly about to enter the race for Republican nomination for president. Haley, who had previously said she wouldn't run if former President Trump was standing, has said that it's time for a new generation of leadership. Trump, who has slammed his likely front-running rival Ron DeSantis, called him disloyal for considering standing, has been, at least for now, considerably more easygoing in this case. Last weekend, he told reporters that she had called him to say that she was considering a run, and he said he encouraged her to go for it. Now, the fact he presumes she has no chance of beating him probably has a lot to do with that. And indeed, you might wonder why Haley or any of the other candidates who are all in single digits of support would ever consider that they have a chance. Now, partly that can be the willful blindness of huge egos, but also it comes to the realisation there is going to be a massive, protracted brawl between the two front runners, Trump and DeSantis. And when that happens, it opens up the possibility, however slim, for a relatively undamaged third candidate to emerge from the bloody wreckage after the front runners have expended all their energy destroying each other. That may be a long shot, but it's enough to make Haley, as well as the likes of Mike Pence and others, plan to make their own moves. The current reckoning is that a crowded field would benefit Trump under the GOP winner-takes-all system for primaries, and Trump remains the front-runner, with polling leads split, sometimes for him, sometimes for DeSantis. In Scotland, the front-runner in many recent elections has always been very clearly the SNP. Is that about to change? Last week I covered the mess in Scotland over the Scottish Nationalist gender ID policies, confronted by the rather late trans-identifying rapist who wanted to be sent to a women's prison. This week it's worth just touching on it again because the question has come up rather credibly, I think, for this huge misstep by the First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, could be the beginning of the political end for her. On the principle that it never rains but it pours, the week started with the news that a second dubiously trans-identifying violent man had been approved by Sturgeon to be moved to a women's prison. And as this man, Andrew Burns, who, if we were to take seriously in his proposed identity as Tiffany Scott, should probably be ashamed for being paraded in handcuffs while topless, I suppose. This man stalked a 13-year-old girl attacked female staff while he was being held in a men's prison and has been described as one of the most menacing people inside Scottish jails. So obviously the logical thing is to send him to a women's prison. The transfer had initially been refused, presumably because not everyone in the prison system has yet had a lobotomy. But that decision was reversed by senior managers, according to the Scottish newspaper The Daily Record. Burns declared himself female and changed his name to Tiffany Scott in 2016, after he'd been sentenced to 14 months jail for stalking that 13-year-old. He is not undergoing treatment. He has not medically transitioned. Female prison officers, who presumably were all bigots, refused to strip search Burns in 2016, with a prison source at the time describing him as a full-time menace who makes it his daily business to be as difficult and awkward as possible. Exactly the sort of person, in other words, who will take full advantage of stupid rules, loopholes and anything else to benefit himself at the expense of the system. We have always known that such people exist and that laws have to be capable of dealing with them. 
And this was where Nicola Sturgeon came to endure a humiliating session in the Scottish Parliament this week because the SNP trans law does not admit of a possibility of loopholes, even when they're big enough to drive a double-decker bus through. The SNP position is that trans women are women, which is a slogan, not a description of physical nor legal reality. And the SNP position is also for self-ID. If a man says he's a woman, then who are we to question him? I mean her. But what if that man is a rapist scumbag, clearly looking you in the face and telling lies for the fun of it? Surely in a pragmatic universe, you have to be able to call that out. Well, maybe, but Nicola Sturgeon has been trying not to live in that universe. So she refused three times in Holyrood to say whether she believes the trans double rapist Adam Graham is a woman. She couldn't say he wasn't, because that would directly contradict her strongly stated previous position that you have no right to contradict such a claim on any grounds. But she couldn't really say that he was, because it was completely obvious to everybody, especially the bemused and slightly horrified public, that it would be a travesty. And the implications would be that people like him would indeed, therefore, be sent to women's prisons. Earlier, her Justice Secretary had said that Bryson should be considered female. Sturgeon said she didn't have enough information to say whether she agreed. How much information do you need? Because the previous position was that all you needed to know was what the person themselves said they were. So we're now qualifying that then? On what grounds? All of these contradictions were forensically unpicked by the opposition, who probably just can't believe their luck. Because this is Nicola Sturgeon, who has remained a hugely popular political figure, in spite of the SNP's not particularly good record in the business of actual government, but rather because of her initial handling of a pandemic and her deft sparring with Westminster over Scottish independence. But all political leaders, once they've been in position for an extended period of time, eventually lose the sureness of touch that got them there. Finally seems as though that might be happening to Sturgeon. Behind the scenes, SNP figures are now privately dismayed at how all of this has played out and her refusal to back down on the issue where the public view is completely clear in the opposite direction. 59% of Britons, including Scots, say that trans offenders convicted of rape or sexual assault who have not had full gender reassignment, in other words, they have a working penis, should go to men's prisons. Just 15% said they should go to a women's prison. Presumably the remainder didn't understand the question because at first glance it seemed so stupid a thing to be asking. Or more likely they're scared that if someone sees how they answered, they'll get cancelled or something. The numbers are not that much difference for male-bodied prisoners whose offences were not violent and not sex-related. 48% said men's prison, 24% women's. The upshot of all of this is that for the first time, people are now talking about the inevitability of Nicola Sturgeon's decline and eventual replacement. Because it was her obsession with the trans issue, positioning that drove this forward. She's no bystander in all of this. She was the driving force behind the bill to make self-declaration automatic before being pulled up by the UK government that refused to allow it to go forward. She was the one who pushed her backbench MSPs into voting down amendments that were specifically designed to avoid this sort of thing, to provide safeguards for women-only spaces. With the independence issue being pushed onto the back burner, that's left the SNP rank and file to focus instead on the sense that they mostly actually share with the public, that Sturgeon just can't see how wrong she's been. One senior nationalist commented to the Telegraph, We can't go on like this. The past fortnight has been terrible. Maybe it's a false dawn, but it looks very much like the beginning of the end. Let's talk about the mainstream media for a few minutes. And it'll be easy to go veering off into the cartoon level exaggerations on the subject, as independent commentators have a self interest in doing. But even if you ignore the wild stuff on the topic over there, it is an institution clearly in serious trouble. 
Go back to 1976, in the wake of the journalistic expose of Watergate, you had the profession at the height of respect for its historic role. 72% of Americans at that point said they trusted the media. Well, that trust has collapsed, and it's a trend that's accelerated in the last decade. Now, only 34% say that they even have a fair amount of trust in the media. 38% say they have none at all, the highest amount ever recorded. Ask the journalists about it, they're generally clear it's someone else's fault. The malevolent spreaders of disinformation who have unfairly maligned them, probably. This week, there was a detailed four-part investigation published that should really give those journos a reality check. The press versus the president. A 20,000-word report in the bastion of establishment journalism, the Columbia Journalism Review, by veteran mainstream reporter Jeff Gerf. Gerf was an investigative prize-winning reporter for decades for the New York Times, very much one of their own. But in the article, he gives a totally comprehensive blow-by-blow account of how members of the press, Democrats, other officials colluded to spin the fiction that the president who took office in 2016 was a Russian asset. Bob Woodward, famed Washington Post editor and veteran of that Watergate scandal, told Gerfer in his view the Russian probe wasn't handled well and he suggested the mainstream press had cheated the public of the truth, which is a big accusation from a pillar of the establishment. He said modern newsrooms should walk down the painful road of introspection. Worth bearing in mind that Woodward had, during the height of the drama over the Steele dossier, told Fox News that it was a garbage document that should never have been part of an official intelligence briefing. So it's not as though this wasn't obvious to some of those old-style industry stalwarts even at the time. But you want to know how the press moved so far between Watergate and the Russia-Trump collusion allegations? A clue can be found in the Washington Post. A piece by Leonard Downey Jr., former top editor at The Post, says this, Newsrooms that move beyond objectivity can build trust. Sounds a dubious proposition. And basically it reflects the apparent change coming into newsrooms with the host of new woke staffers. And he says this, Objectivity is defined by most dictionaries as expressing or using facts without distortion by personal beliefs, bias, feelings or prejudice. Journalistic objectivity has generally been understood to mean much the same thing. Ah, but no longer, apparently. But increasingly, reporters, editors and media critics argue that the concept of journalistic objectivity is a distortion of reality. They point out that the standard was dictated over decades by male editors in predominantly white newsrooms and reinforced their own view of the world. So objectivity is white. Let the stupidity commence. More and more journalists of colour and younger white reporters, including LGBTQ plus people in increasingly diverse newsrooms, believe that the concept of objectivity has prevented truly accurate reporting informed by their own backgrounds, experiences and points of view. Because nothing says accurate reporting like pushing your point of view. Downey had consulted widely with the journalistic elites in the writing of his piece and the conclusion was voiced by Emilio Garcia Ruiz. The consensus among younger journalists is that we got it all wrong. Objectivity has got to go. This is the best predictor I've seen that the trust in the press is going to continue its decline, particularly when it comes to politics and the issues that are held contentious between the two sides. If independent media could avoid getting caught in the same trap, because let's be clear, a lot of independents simply say, whatever that side says, the opposite must be true. If it can avoid that, it could find an opportunity to fill what will become an increasingly obvious gap. To go there, we have to end the hyperbole, the generalisations, the tribal flag waving and focus instead on fine-tuning an energetic curiosity into what's really going on and why. And sadly, citizens will be forced to do that as well, as they start to look at the positions of their politicians, the slanted way this is covered by the media, and to realise that they can't trust what they're being told. Now, the fact some people grab that lack of trust, dash off into extreme conclusions in colourful ways, doesn't make it any less of a real factor for the mainstream of our society. 
Rather than joining the conspiracists, we need to sober up and focus, like the less drunk person who needs to help the more drunk friend get home. All right, my thanks as always to the people who support this channel on Patreon. No big mainstream news organisations with deep pockets here. It makes a crucial difference. If you would like to add your support for the independent, fact-focused, non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash Baker. It is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name is Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.